I've been playing around with the idea that you could take the science behind acorns, rising testosterone, and how a ruminant's microbiome makes digestive transitions to predict mature buck movement. And I think I'm onto something. This video is not about the rut, but I feel like the rut is a good starting point for the video to help show the effectiveness of the early season. I'll try to refrain from explaining the science behind the rut for now, and we'll mainly just focus on the basics. The rut only comes once a year, and in theory, peaks for a really short time. For Missouri, the first estrus wave includes roughly 70 to 80% of adult does entering estrus during this peak window. For my area, experts estimate that this takes place around November 10th to the 20th. But as most hunters notice, this is not a statistic set in stone. It is not uncommon to find mature bucks starting to tend does in estrus as early as the start of November. This state fluctuates so much that studies have displayed completely different peak windows between neighboring properties. They have also identified different peak windows on the same properties on a year-by-year -year basis. The second wave, or the secondary rut, generally takes place 20 to 30 days post-peak rut. It includes an estimate of 10 to 20 percent of the does that weren't bred during peak rut, and fawns that have finally reached critical mass. Critical mass is when a doe fawn reaches the weight and body condition needed to survive the winter, and successfully support an unborn fawn. This creates a very large window for potential does and estrus. In my area, if a doe comes into heat slightly early on November 5th and goes unbred across that 24 to 48 hour window, she could re-enter estrus anywhere from November 27th to December 7th. If you had a doe come into estrus a touch late, let's say November 25th, and go unbred across the 24 to 48 hour window, she would re-enter estrus around December 17th to December 27th. And lastly, we have the late and kind of third wave. For me, this is around January, and a smaller percentage, maybe 5 to 10%, made up of mostly yearlings and late-born fawns, will re-enter estrus in this time frame if unbred for their original late window. As you can see, it can get a little bit overwhelming. With does cycling into estrus over an extended period of time, and dominant bucks locking down and tending for the majority of that time, your chances of catching a mature buck slip up in this time frame is pretty high. But in overpopulated areas, he won't be on his feet nearly as much as people think. That's because there's going to be so many does in that particular area that he just doesn't have to travel as far to go from one doe in estrus to the next in estrus. You've probably planned your vacation time around the peak rut for your area, but if you're targeting a few specific deer, those answers can be found at the beginning of the season. Unlike the core of the season, Mature bucks are very active in the evening on a predictable feeding pattern during this short period of time. A mature buck's behavior during September is almost completely disconnected from October and November. What this means is that the habitat you traditionally encounter mature bucks in during the fall may or may not be used by them during the summer. Therefore, the strategies and stands that you use come peak rut are probably not going to apply that much at the beginning of the season. I'm going to pause the video for a quick disclaimer. I'm actually starting a Patreon with one single tier. The benefits will include things like behind the scenes content that doesn't fit on my channel, live Q&A streams, private property, and maybe some public land breakdowns, voting for community input on future research ideas and videos, and some technology deep dives that I get asked about a lot in terms of what type of gear I'm using. You may also become a test subject in a way for any merchandising and other random ideas that I ever come across. If you're interested, I've included a link to it in the description of the video. Thanks guys. First, we need to locate a summer buck herd. For ag land, just take a casual stroll to your spot, settle on the edge of a crop field with your binoculars, and enjoy a nice, relaxed, leisurely scouting session. Bucks typically move in groups, with the size of the group largely dictated by the amount of available food. They navigate through distinct feeding zones, and are best observed from positions that offer long-range visibility. In low pressure areas, does and younger bucks often bed right up against the desired feeding zone. Mature bucks are often found 50 to 200 yards away from their feeding zone, but I have recorded them bedding right up against their food source pretty often, especially in times of disparity. Finding a bachelor group is only the first step. You really need to identify the cover that the deer is using during the day, which can often be done without ever entering the woods. If possible, most mature bucks prefer to utilize multiple feeding zones. Finding both of these locations will allow you to pinpoint the section of timber that he's using for his bedding. In the end, ag land scouting is not that difficult, so kick back and enjoy the show. Hill country, Alabama rainforests, and I'm assuming deltas are miserable compared to ag. For starters, in hill country, there are hills. It's flipping hot, and in my experience, these areas have far more bugs that would like to eat you or carry you away. An e-bike would likely help you with hill country endeavors. I'm too poor for one of those, but I do have a mountain bike. In these types of habitat, the main challenge is actually finding mature bucks 
during the summer. With ample native browse, you're going to have to spend many hours on foot trying to stumble across their bedding area. While I've previously stated my reservations about using trail cameras, they do have some potential use here. If you're not able to scout for a good amount of time, you're likely to wind up with more questions than answers. If the trail cameras can produce an image of a target buck, take it for what it is, a snapshot of time whenever the deer was in that location. You can use this information potentially to hone in on where your target buck is bedding, but do not rely solely on technology. And we get to possibly the most important step for the Midwest. Whether or not you've definitively found summer bedding areas, you can and should identify and map acorns in the area that you want to come back and check on. In particular, look for little openings next to mature timber with large white oaks standing out on their own. Trees in the open are not in competition with others for resources, nor are they restricted or limited by sunlight through the canopy. This enables them to receive maximum amounts of sunlight and produce a larger mass quantity of acorns. Trees in dense, mature timber have reduced light availability and more competition. One of the least discussed and possibly most powerful factors driving early season deer behavior is what's happening inside the rumen. White-tailed deer are ruminants, equipped with a four-chambered stomach that relies heavily on microbial fermentation to extract energy from plants. But here's the catch. The microbes themselves must constantly adjust to the seasonal diet shifts deer face. This adaptation period is a major driver of deer movement, feeding intensity, and possibly bedding predictability during the early season. Some of you may know how this works, but for those of you that don't, let's explain how the four-chambered stomach digests its food. Let's start with the rumen. This is the largest chamber functioning as its microbial fermentation vat. It houses billions of bacteria, protozoa, and fungi that break down cellulose, hemicellulose, and other complex carbohydrates into volatile fatty acids. These serve as the deer's primary energy source. The rumen also acts as a storage reservoir, permitting rapid intake of forage followed by a slower microbial digestion. Next, we have the reticulum. This section works closely with the rumen, and it's essentially a honeycombed lining that's trapping dense or indigestible material and facilitates regurgitation of partially digested cud. This process allows for secondary mastication, reducing particle size, and improving microbial access to the plant cell walls. Then we have the third chamber, omasum. I could be saying that wrong. This section functions as a biological filter. It has many muscular folds that increase surface area and selectively absorb water, electrolytes, and residual VFAs while grinding plant particles even further before they enter the abomasum. And last, we have the abomasum. This section is considered to be the true stomach. Here, gastric glands secrete hydrochloric acid and proteolytic enzymes, breaking down microbial proteins, dietary proteins, and microbial cell walls. This step provides amino acids and nutrients for absorption in the small intestine later on. This system enables deer to subsist on highly variable seasonal diets, converting otherwise indigestible plant matter into metabolizable energy. During the summer, deer feed heavily on forbs, legumes, and available agriculture crops. These plants are often high in protein and moisture content, low in lignin and structural fiber, and they're rapidly fermentable or digestible. Come September in my area, a few major changes hit simultaneously. We have mass crops that decide to drop, like acorns, persimmons, and apples. These food sources are rich in starches and fats, and contain secondary components like tannins, which can bind proteins and reduce digestibility. And then we also have the native browse, which is maturing, which means that there's going to be more cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin content in the plant. These require a completely different set of microbes to break down the cell plant wall. And finally, the part that's actually important for the hunters, this shift that's taking place in their microbiome is not instantaneous, which plays to the hunter's advantage. The microbial populations inside of the rumen need 7 to 14 days to restructure and scale up the new teams of microbes capable of digesting woody, fibrous, and tannin-heavy foods. At the beginning of the 7 to 14 days, deer are unable to extract as much energy from the mast and browse that they need. This leads to a digestive bottleneck, which forces deer to feed more frequently to meet their nutritional goals. The adaptation window is why deer are so patternable during the early season. They'll hit a food source hard and repeatedly because their gut microbes haven't diversified enough to handle the new type of diet that they're providing. One little bonus feature about fermentation, especially through this time where they're going through a really dramatic change. Fermentation is exothermic. That means that it produces heat. During this transition, microbial turnover spikes, meaning more internal heat is generated. Couple that with a warm early season, this is definitely going to help push deer to bed in much cooler microclimates because not only is it hot externally, but they're actually internally hot 
thanks to fermentation. That's a direct physiological link between rumen function and bedding behavior. There happens to be one more really important event that takes place during this time frame. Bucks are shedding velvet. Velvet shedding coincides almost perfectly with the dietary shift from forbs and crops to mast and woody brows. So at the very moment bucks are adjusting to rising testosterone, their rumen is also retooling itself all at the same time. If you own private land and want to help supplement this microbial shift, then you may have one final alternative. While food plots are not for every person, they require financial input, physical effort, and quite a bit of time. There are many situations where they can be very useful and help diversify your property. Food plots are excellent for hunting the perimeter of them and trying to position yourself near staging areas. They can be difficult to establish early on. For reference, this year in my area, like many, it's in quite a bit of a drought. Not only does this affect your food plot production, but it also affects acorn production. In situations like this, deer are probably in for a pretty harsh winter. If a deer suddenly shifts to browsing on really low quality, woody browse that's hard to digest, its rumen may not be fully developed to allow for that. That means that even though the rumen is physically full, the microbial community isn't actually available to efficiently ferment the fiber. In this case, the deer would be stuffed with food, but starving at a cellular level because the VFAs being produced don't meet the energy demands required for the deer to survive. This is where the phrase death on a full stomach comes from. And the most likely culprit to this issue is actually gonna be your dominant buck in the area. See, he's depleted all of his energy stores going into the late season throughout that rut time frame. And in many cases, an adequately sized food plot can actually possibly save his life going into the late season. I hope this video helped expand your mind and gave you a new way to look at early season deer behavior. Best of luck to those already hunting and those about to get started. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.